In Unit 5, we'll be studying the hydrosphere. Hydrosphere is all water on Earth. That includes water that is frozen in glaciers and ice caps. It includes water in the ocean, as well as our freshwater systems, which include lakes, ponds, streams, rivers, and groundwater. So we'll start with the water cycle. The water cycle, or hydrologic cycle, is the continuous movement of water from the atmosphere to Earth's surface and back again. And so if you look at this diagram, you can see that not only does the water move from the surface to the atmosphere, but it also goes under Earth's surface into groundwater. And we'll be looking at each of these stages that a water droplet would follow as it travels through the water cycle. Evaporation is the change of state from liquid to gas or liquid to vapor. 86% um, of all evaporation occurs from the oceans, which is where most of our water is located. And then 14% occurs from our surface water, lakes, streams, and even soil moisture. Transpiration is when plants give off water vapor. Remember that water vapor is one of the byproducts of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is where plants are taking carbon dioxide and converting it into oxygen. So one of the other outputs is also water vapor. The picture right here is transpiration from the leaves in a rainforest, which as they are evaporating are also condensing to form clouds. So condensation is when the vapor, as it rises into the air, it cools and then condenses. In order for water to condense or change from liquid back into gas, there has to be several things present. First is a drop in temperature. Second, there has to be something for the water to condense on. So if you look in this diagram, there is particulate matter that is in the atmosphere. That could be dust, pollen, solid pollutants. So when the water changes into liquid, those droplets stick to that particulate matter. We call those condensation nuclei. Um, if it's cold enough, the water droplets turn into ice crystals and eventually get enough, when there's enough saturation, and enough moisture, it forms clouds. So clouds are actually formed from droplets of ice if they are higher altitude clouds or water if they are lower altitude clouds. You've probably also seen condensation if you have a cold drink. It's not the liquid from inside the cup that forms on the outside. It's actually water vapor that's um, as a gas in the air surrounding the cup. Because the cup is colder, that water condenses and turns into a liquid and sticks to the outside of the cup. Now, when our clouds ha are completely saturated, then the water is going to fall to Earth's surface. Now, there's several different types of precipitation depending on um, the conditions. Once again, most of the precipitation is going to fall into the ocean because that's what's covering most of our surface, and then the other 25% onto the land. So rain is when it hits the ground as a liquid. It might start off frozen, but by the time it gets to Earth's surface, um, it has turned into liquid. Freezing rain hits the ground as a liquid, but then freezes if surface temperatures um, are below freezing. So this, these are our damaging ice storms when the power lines, the tree limbs, the ice builds up causing them to break and fall. Snow starts frozen in the cloud, remains frozen until it hits the ground. Sleet um, would be rain that freezes on its way to the ground, so you get these perfectly round shapes that are basically frozen raindrops. And then the last type is hail. Hailstones form when raindrops are thrown high up in the clouds if you have heavy updrafts, and basically they get larger and larger as they bounce around in the cloud. So when they fall to the ground, they can be as small as sleet or as large as the hailstones that you see in this diagram. All right, sometimes when precipitation hits the Earth's surface, um, it infiltrates or soaks into the ground and becomes groundwater. If it does not soak into the ground, it runs off, um, runs into streams, which can feed into lakes. Um, when water runs off, it takes any particles that are in the soil with it, so fertilizers, manure, soil. And if those run into our larger bodies of water, then that can create big problems, which we'll talk about later in this unit when we discuss water pollution.
All right, in the U.S., each person uses about 95 square meters of water. Um, most of the water in the U.S. is actually used to irrigate crops, and so that's water that's used uh, to water our crops in areas that we don't get enough rainfall. 90% of the waters that's used in cities and industry is actually returned to the rivers or sometimes the ocean as wastewater. Either it's dumped directly by an industry or, as with our sewage, it goes to a wastewater treatment plant where it's cleaned before it can be dumped into a river. Because we don't want sewage in our rivers. If we look at where water is located on the earth, 97% uh, is found in the oceans. The other 3% is fresh water. Now, of that fresh water, 77% of that is frozen, so either in glaciers or ice caps. The other um, fresh water is either groundwater or surface water. So notice that only 1% of our fresh water which is 3% of the overall water on Earth, is our surface waters, our lakes, rivers, and streams. So we have a very small percentage of water that is actually usable. All right, so looking at that 22% of fresh water that seeps into the ground, it becomes groundwater. And it's going to seep down until it reaches what we call the zone of saturation. So the soil right here is dry. We call that the zone of aeration. And the area where water is filling in all of the open space in the sediments and rocks is the zone of saturation. The top boundary of the zone of saturation is called the water table. Above that, the zone of aeration, if you notice, the pore spaces are not saturated with water. And then there is going to be some moisture that remains in the topsoil. We call that the soil moisture. Groundwater moves through small openings in the rocks or sediments that we call pore space. So notice if you follow this red line here, that shows us how water is moving through the pore space in those sediments. Porosity is the term that we use to describe the amount of pore space or the percentage of pore space in the soil. So if you look at these two, the one on the left has a higher porosity than the one on the right. Oops. So it can hold more water. Permeability is how easy it is for water to travel through those pore spaces. So looking at this picture, the white represents the pore spaces. So there's some areas where water can travel through, but it's not as permeable as this picture on the right. See, there's more paths for the, the water to follow. So even if a soil or rock has good porosity, that doesn't necessarily mean it has good permeability. If water cannot travel through a soil or rock, we say that it is impermeable. Clay is a type of soil that is impermeable. The particles are too small to have enough pore space for the water to travel through. Any layer of soil or rock, um, usually rock, that is permeable, that water can travel through, uh, we say is an aquifer. And we can use those aquifers to harvest our groundwater, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But notice this zone of saturation here, where the pore space is completely filled with water, is an aquifer. Above that, the zone of aeration is not saturated, so the water infiltrates through until it reaches the water table. All right, when the water table reaches the surface, that is known as a spring. And you can see here, the water table is right here. And so everything below that is saturated. So the water is just pouring out into this river. Now a hot spring is where groundwater is heated by the cooling of igneous rock or if you have a magma chamber underneath. So you can see this water is steaming because it's being heated from underground. Now sometimes that heated underground water causes geysers, and geysers are just hot springs that erupt intermittently. This one is Old Faithful, which erupts about every um, hour and a half or slightly longer. Um, but the groundwater boils, produces steam, and erupts. So right here, so you see after the geyser erupts, that steam condenses, infiltrates, or seeps back down into the ground. Oops. Once it gets into the ground, it's heated by that magma chamber where it rises, it boils, produces steam, then the steam erupts once again. So it's a constant cycle.
All right, so when we want to use groundwater, we dig a well that goes down below that zone of saturation. If we dig it down into the zone of aeration, you turn your faucet on, it's going to be very dry. So we need an area where the pore spaces are completely saturated. Now, as you use water, let's say that I have a large neighborhood that's all um, dug wells down into the zone of saturation, that water table can actually drop over time. And wells can go dry if the water table drops below the zone of saturation. Now, sometimes groundwater can rise on its own without pumping. Normal wells you have to pump. But right here, um, if you look, this is called an artesian well because there's no pump. The water underground is stuck in between two impermeable layers, so it's moving downhill. And it's moving downhill on this side. So if I dig a well down into that zone of saturation, the water is going to come out on its own. And that's what you see here in this picture. Now, looking at several groundwater features, if you have a lot of carbonic acid that's in the groundwater in an area that contains limestone, which is the rock you see here, the groundwater can dissolve the limestone. As the groundwater drips through the cavern, it creates dripstone because there's calcite dissolved in the water that gets left behind. The dripstone that hangs from the ceiling are called stalactites, and the dripstone that forms on the floor of the cave are called stalagmites. The last groundwater feature that we're going to look at is something that we call karst topography. Uh, which usually results in sinkholes. The, this forms in areas where you have a lot of underground caves that are close to the surface, and if the roof of the cave or cavern collapses, then you get topography that looks like this. So these are all underground caves that have collapsed. Um, sometimes they can be very damaging, especially if they are under roads or near houses, but this is an example of an area where a cavern, its roof collapsed, and it was right next to a home. Now, luckily, not close enough that this home fell in, but usually what happens is over time, sinkholes get larger. All right, so water cycle and groundwater are what we concentrated on today, and the next module will be looking at surface water.